Hi, I'm Russell. And I'm Stacy. And we took marriage team coaching before we were married to build a solid foundation for our relationship and our marriage. Russell and I were dating and we had come to a point where we weren't doing very well. The communication pretty much stalled out. Um, I had closed out any, didn't want to listen to anything she had to say, felt bottled up inside. And the more I pushed for the communication, the worse it the worse got. got. There was a presentation on marriage team given during one of the church services and um, it talked about gaining skills in communication and I was all in and I talked him into checking it out with me. At first I was like, no, no, I'd, I've been to counseling before and stuff and it's like, no, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to do that. And our relationship got to the point of, of just falling apart and finally decided that we needed to do it to build up a good relationship. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about Russell. I learned um, skills and tools to use in communication. It's been really helpful as far as um, not as many misunderstandings in our relationship. Oh, yeah. And it helped me to be able to open up and communicate, show my feelings better. When when I'm hurt, I don't shut her, shut her out. I'm able to hey, be able to let her know that I'm I, that hurt my feelings and be able to talk about it. And the coach has also helped me realize that I had hurts deep inside of me that I needed to work out outside of marriage team and help me with that also. I would absolutely recommend marriage team coaching to other couples. It was absolutely foundational for us. Yes. You, you learn how to care about the other person's feelings more and you would not necessarily think about yourself so much, but how you come across to the other person. It's being intentional with your words. Yes. For me, marriage coaching um, gave us the skills we needed to be successful in our marriage. And we were able to work with another couple that has gone through the marriage team coaching and have a successful marriage and were able to lead us by example. Isn't that encouraging? And as I say, it was a little different picture, but I asked Russ and Stacy if I could tell them a little bit about the background, and both of them had been in other relationships, they had children with other people, and they had, in many ways, a typical, here's how we're going to try to put a home together from all these broken pieces. And they'd literally come to a place where they were ready to call it off. And in the middle of that, I admire them. They did a right thing. They said, we need help. They came and they got help and they listened and they took that to heart. And because of that, God put their marriage together. And uh, it was a beautiful thing. We've been using this picture of the Japanese art of kintsuki, which is the repairing of broken pottery and not just putting glue in between it, but there's a gold dust that then makes this a, a beautiful piece that's better, different, more interesting than it would have been originally. And, uh, and there's another way in which God worked a miracle because Russ said feelings three times in two and a half minutes. So I was like, that's, that's really a change of heart, right? I want to talk this weekend about broken marriages. It's a emotional topic. And last week we talked about broken sexuality, which was also walking on a tight wire. And I wanted to say I appreciated the feedback. Several of you said, I'm glad that our church talks about hard things and you do it in a biblical way and you do it in a caring way. And I, I appreciate that feedback. Um, we're talking about broken marriages. And again, we want to come back to why is our culture so messed up and what is God's plan in the middle of that mess? And my goal is to encourage and strengthen the marriages that exist, the ones 
that you are in a marriage and it is difficult and you're ready to fight through that and we want to help support you. So we're going to hold up God's ideal of marriage. The downside or the difficulty that we have to also work with is some of you have been married and divorced multiple times. You may have been divorced recently and we are trying in no way to make you feel like more of a victim or bring up hard and hurtful things. We're trying to say this is God's ideal and we're going to hold it up together. In fact, my goal for us this weekend is whether you're single and have never been married, whether you're married right now, whether you're separated, divorced, remarried, whatever your status is, that we will agree together that we want to support and build a picture for what a Christ-centered marriage should be. And that all of us work to support that, either in our own lives or to support other people in that process. So I hope that we can come together and say, yeah, that's important. And there was a, a great seminar yesterday on spiritual warfare by Gary Brashears. And he talked about, in a, in a little bigger picture, he said, you know, when, when God put Adam and Eve in the garden and they were to build a life of shalom, and that means more than just peace, it means the way it's supposed to be. And when they were going to organize the garden, they were bringing shalom. He said that was an act of war, that Satan is the He called him the destruction monster, the chaos monster. And he's wanting to kill, to steal, destroy. And so God sets up these individuals and families to bring shalom. And that's spiritual warfare, is every time you're trying to bring shalom. And is marriage difficult? Okay, guys, don't make me feel like I'm standing up here by myself. (laughs) That was an easy question. Is marriage difficult? Yeah, is it harder than you thought it would be? Yeah, people that are married 50 years ought to get more than just a cake, right? (laughs) They ought to have a, a row of medals of survival. Because in our culture, marriages are being shredded. And the reason is because most of them are built on faulty foundations. And the statistics are sad. Did you know that first marriages are failing at a 41% rate? Second marriages are failing at a 60% rate. Third marriages are failing at a 73% rate. Does this say we're not learning anything? Yeah. And you know, the, the sad part is that a lot of young people have decided, and not just young people, a lot of people have decided, so marriage is the problem. So I'm not going to get married. We're just going to live together. Do you know that if you live together and then get married, it increases your chance of divorcing by up to 40%. So what we're talking about today is how to beat the odds. Because this is the culture that we live in. This is the state of marriage today. And I want to say, for those who chose to live together, how is living together for four years and having two kids and mingling your finances and mingling your, your possessions and then breaking it up, how is that not a divorce? It shreds you just the same way, doesn't it? It's just not legally the same thing. So we want to talk about, first of all, why are things breaking apart? And secondly, how can we rebuild the foundation? So if you have your Bibles or if you want to open your phone app, uh, we're in Matthew chapter 7. And I'm going to, I struggle this week because there's so much we could talk about. And we're doing a family series in about five weeks, and I don't want to steal my own thunder for that time. So I picked two things that Jesus says One is about our own personal lives, and one is about marriage. And I want to just focus in on, let's see what Jesus has to say. So I'm reading in chapter 7, verse 24. He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. So Jesus says, let me tell you the difference between a life that lasts in the storms. Do storms always come? You look in both of those homes, they both got hit with a hurricane. Storms come into our lives. If you haven't had a storm yet, it's coming. The question is, is what holds in the storm? 
And so Jesus said the difference is not who hears God's words. You're here today, we're talking about the scripture, maybe you call yourself a Christian. That's not the distinction. He says the one who hears and puts it into what? Practice. Practice. So those that take God's word and daily begin to make them part of my lifestyle, part of how I treat people, part of how I get involved in preparing for marriage, how I preserve a marriage, that has to do with whether I listen to Jesus or I kind of do my own thing. And he says, if you're doing your own thing, good luck. You're going to have a collapse at some point. So what are those foundations that are failing on us? Well, let's look through our culture and just say, why is it that couples have such a hard time when they come to the point of trying to keep their marriage? And I think Jesus nails it to start with. There's a spiritual vacuum in most homes. Now, sometimes it's obvious. It's sad when young people grow up in the church, get involved in youth group, give their life to Christ, they make a good start, and then they fall in love with somebody who doesn't love Christ. And they say, well, you know, maybe he'll become a Christian soon. Let me tell you, evangelistic dating is a bad idea. <laughs> Find somebody who loves the Lord and build a home with them because when you have opposite foundations, you are going opposite directions. And if one wants to please God and follow God and listen to God and be doing godly things, and the other one says, no, I want to go have fun, I want to do my life, I want to do what I want to do, that will lead to division. The second part, and maybe even more concerning for me, is there are a lot of people who call themselves Christians. Maybe they even read the Bible, and maybe they even have a personal relationship with Christ. But when it comes to marriage, they are not putting God's words into practice. All those verses that say, forgive one another and be humble and listen and all those things, that's not just talking about everybody. This is a marriage manual. And we got to take those things and say, oh, that means with my wife. I behave this way. I live a life of love with my husband, with my children, with my parents. So there's a spiritual vacuum that people are hearing, even if they hear God's words, they're not putting them daily into practice. And sadly, on Monday through Saturday, a lot of times Christian homes are very little different from secular homes. So there's a spiritual vacuum. Secondly, broken backgrounds lead to broken homes. The more divorce becomes common, the more brokenness becomes normal, the more brokenness happens. In fact, statistically, if you came from a home where your parents divorced, then you are 14% more likely to have a broken marriage. Why? Even if you hated it, even if you say, I'm never going to do that, you end up with a lot of brokenness in you, and for some part of you, it seems normal to divorce, because that's what your parents did. That was a picture of normal. And so we come through these processes where we go through the brokenness, especially if the divorce happened when you were young. There are some deep distrusts that are placed in you. I can't trust anybody. If I couldn't trust my parents to love each other and to both of them stay with me, then how can I really trust anybody else? And so you end up with kind of a, I call it a survival mentality. I got to take care of me because nobody else is going to. And that's a dangerous way to start a marriage. So broken foundations in our culture. And that often leads to even more unrealistic expectations. We often come into marriage thinking, I'm kind of broke and I'm kind of messed up. I've got some issues. Oh, you look good. Why don't I hook up with you so that you can make me happy? And people don't say that out loud. They just live it out loud. And we go into relationships thinking, oh, you make me feel so wonderful, therefore I love you. But that means as soon as you quit making me feel wonderful, then I don't love you anymore. And I know this is a bad joke. Let me apologize ahead of time. <laughs> Too many people go into marriage like a tick looking for a dog. They want to find somebody to suck their life from. You can groan, it's okay. <laughs> and they get married and they find there's two ticks and no dog. <laughs> I know it's sick, but you'll never forget it. <laughs> if you go into marriage thinking it's the marriage that will make you happy, 
you will be deeply disappointed. <laughs> and, and then people commit a second insanity. Let's have kids. They will make us happy because <laughs> kids are so easy and wonderful. And, and kids come in to enhance your life, right? Yeah, 20 years later, maybe. And so we go in with unrealistic expectations, which is why we need vows. You ever think about that? What else do you take vows for? And you say, yes, do you accept them for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health? Why? Because the storms will always come. And don't be like the young bride when the pastor said, will you take him for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health? And she said, yes, no, yes, no, no, yes. I want the happily ever after. What happened to that? And people often are surprised when they find out marriage is a lot of work. And they're not prepared for that. Another problem is we have poor communication skills. You go to school for 12 years just to be sort of a normal functioning adult. And then uh, you go to college if you want to do some specialty work. And we do all that for our careers. How much training do you have in marriage, family, and parenting? Yeah. Actually, it's worse than that. You have some training, and most of it's bad. You have bad examples. You have wrong things that you're taught. You have lies that you believe. And there are very few good listeners. Usually, you can find them. They have a crowd of people around them wanting to talk to them. We have lots of people who want to talk or want to ignore, but they don't want to listen. They don't want to communicate. And frankly, we don't know how. We have not been trained. We don't have good skills in that. And so you go into marriage, which requires a lot of communication and conflict resolution. And of course, most people that have at least some communication skills, as soon as they get mad, they lose them all. And then they go to either shout out or shut out. This is the good news. God wants us to rebuild a foundation that will last in the storm. Wherever you are in this process of being married or not being married, I think we need to come together and say God's foundation is the only possibility of hope for people. This is a stretch of a coastline in Gilchrist, Texas, after Hurricane Ike went through in 2008. What you can't see on this picture is if you had drawn, driven down this road a week before the hurricane, there were 200 homes here, all high-scale, upscale homes. This was a rich, beautiful section, and the hurricane took it out. And what have you got left? What do you have left? Thank you. <laughs> this house had been weakened by a hurricane in 2005 and had been rebuilt to be hurricane strong. You see, that's what I feel like we need to commit to as a church, is how do we help homes? How do we have homes that are hurricane strong? Because storms will come. Jesus promised that, didn't he? He said, the rain's going to come, the storm's going to rise, it'll beat against the house. The question is not, how do I get out of the storm? The question is, how do I stand in the storm? And even more importantly, how do I build between hurricanes so that I'm ready for the next one? And I think that's a powerful picture. And I want to give you some specific advice. And some of it will be uh, general. Some of it you can make specifically to your own life wherever it is right now. Turn over a couple of pages to Matthew chapter 19. And this is where Jesus gets asked specifically about divorce. Again, it's the Pharisees and they're trying to trip him up. They're trying to discredit Jesus. And so in chapter 19 verse 3 it says... Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They said, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Now, let me give you a little background here. In the context of Jesus' day, people had different views on marriage and divorce, as we do today. And it was generally connected to the rabbi that taught a particular thing. And there were two major rabbis in this time. One of them was named Shammai. And he taught that in Deuteronomy 24, when Moses said, if you divorce your wife, you have to give her a certificate of divorce. You can't just leave her. You have to make it legal. And he said, if there's some unfaithfulness or uncleanness or something wrong, and that word is a little disputed. And so Shammai said, what that means is if your wife is sexually unfaithful, that's the only reason you can divorce. 
The other school was named a guy named Hillel. And Hillel was a rabbi who taught, and it had gradually grown and grown over the years. You can divorce your wife if she does something, and he translated the word displeasing to you. And so instead of it being clearly somebody cheated on you, now it began to be expanded for any and every reason. In fact, one of the cited reasons if she burns your toast. <laughs> so basically, marriage under Hillel was like in America today. You can divorce for any and every reason. And so they're asking Jesus, trying to pigeonhole him, trying to get him into a, a box where they can, they can discredit him. And he answered a little more than they expected. Haven't you read, that's always a good way to talk back to religious teachers. <laughs> you should read your Bibles, guys. At the beginning, the creator made them male and female. And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, shall be united or cling or connected to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So we talked about those three phrases last week. He says this is kind of a trilogy that's actually mentioned several places in the scripture. That marriage is about a man leaves his father and mother, and a woman leaves her father and mother, and there's this legal joining as you are leaving your home of origin and you're forming a new home. That's the legal side. And then there is the being united, being connected, being a love covenant relationship. That's the emotional, the, the social side of it. And then he says, and the two become one flesh. And, and that's the sexual side of it, that the two are bonded together in this sacred sex that says, now they are one flesh. And then he says, what God put together. So he said, in all this process of joining a man and woman like this, this is more than just a piece of paper and a piece of metal. This is, he said, God binding two people together. And then he makes this warning. What God's put together, don't you mess with. Husbands, don't you mess with it. Wives, don't you mess with it. Mother-in-laws, don't you mess with it. Friends, don't you mess with it. This is a sacred thing. And so God says that's the way marriage should be. Why then, they said, did Moses command that a woman give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Ha, you're contradicting Moses again. He said, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. I tell you, it was not that way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. His disciples said, if that's the situation between a husband and wife, it's better not to marry. And Jesus said, well, if you can accept that, that's okay. So he didn't back up. He says, no, let me tell you, marriage is a sacred deal, but marriage is built to last, listen, if it's built on Jesus. It's built to last if not only we are involved in a personal relationship with Christ where we have submitted to him and have confessed our sins and we've accepted his salvation for our lives, not only then, but he says, you take the words that I've said and you put them into practice in your marriage. A marriage needs to be centered on God. How does that happen? What does that look like? Well, I love the phrase from Joshua 24 that's often put on posters or plaques in people's houses. It says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the right order. First of all, you say, as for me, I'm going to serve the Lord. I've come to say, God, I've committed my life to you. And, you know, people look at the, the Bible's rules and you, you forget that God loves us. And he gave us rules so that he can protect us and provide for us. And when you quit seeing God as the, the, the buzz killer, the rule maker, you start seeing him as he's the source of life. Where does life come from? Where does shalom come from? God's peace. It comes from God. Where does forgiveness come from? You see, quite often we come into our marriage relationship and we're thinking, I love you if you love me. If you don't love me, forget it. And what happens is it doesn't take much to break us up. But when you say God has loved me, he's given me grace when I didn't deserve it. So I have grace to give to you. I've been given so much love from God, so now I have love to give to you. Instead of coming into this marriage on a what have you done for me lately, how come you didn't do this, or how come you don't say that, I need this, it switches it completely. 
And you say, okay, God, I go and I get my filling from you. And then I come to my marriage and now I can serve. And if you are not doing what I expected you to do, I love you with his love. See, it makes all the difference in the world. Instead of seeing myself as a needy person trying to suck life from some other person, I see myself as a child of God, as somebody who's been given grace. And because I've been forgiven a million dollar debt, I can forgive you your debts. Because I've been given a purpose in life, I can come to you and we can work on our purpose together. See, it it changes absolutely everything. Because we often go into marriage with a me-centered I want you to do this for me. Instead of saying, here's what God has given me, allow me to give that to you. Um, Jan and I were talking about this this week, and in Philippians, there's a phrase, and it talks about serving each other in love and loving each other, and then it says, we have the mind of Christ. And that's never really, I haven't really understood how to say that in a different way. And Jan had this great line. She said, in the middle of our marriage, we have an alternate way of looking at things offered to us. Instead of looking at it like I'm looking at it, we have this alternate way of seeing it from God's point of view. How does God feel about your children? How does God feel about your wife? How does God feel about your husband? And you start saying, if I will slow down and let the Spirit of God fill me and I will listen, I can tap into this alternate way of seeing the world. That's what having the mind of Christ means. That at any given moment, when I am tempted to just be my old self, I can have the mind of Christ if I am centered on Christ. And what happens if that is true? Let me give you the good news. People who call themselves evangelicals, who would say, I believe in the Bible and being born again, the divorce rate drops to 25%. And you know what? There's a new study that's done of people who actually are attending church together. They get involved in a life group. They try to have a personal quiet time at home. They try to teach their children about the scriptures. And the divorce rate goes to 7%. What I'm saying is that God's word actually works in a statistical way. You want to increase your chances? He says, put my words as the foundation. And then what will you do? Then you will choose to learn. You see, we have very little marriage education and we have very little communication education and we need to become students. How do I speak so that people will listen? How do I listen so that people can share their hearts and trust me? That's a much different communication strategy than this is what I'm feeling, you're going to hear it, which is how we mostly do. So how do you learn? Well, you can come to this series that we're going to have starting September 30th, which is going to be talking about the foundations of a home and what are our values and how do we come together as a church to build homes that will last. And that's going to start September 30th uh, at all of our campuses. I invite you to come for that. Make sure that's a priority or watch online. And then you can read books. There are some fantastic marriage books, and I will make a confession. I have read far more marriage and counseling books because I have to counsel than I have because I'm a husband but they've helped anyway. I've learned, a lot of, I've learned a lot about marriage by counseling over the years. And this, this book, the, the subtitle is worth the whole book. It says, what if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? Ooh, nasty question, huh? I hope that bothers you for a long time. What if the whole purpose of God putting you into your family wasn't so that you could be everybody taking care of you and making you happy? What if it was so God could develop character and patience and love and joy and serving in you? And then maybe you say, I'm not much of a reader. Well, we have a wonderful resource called Right Now Media. And if you don't have it, give us your email on the Connect card and say Right Now Media, and we'll send you a link. And you can get this free video resource that we've provided as a church. And uh, it, there's a couple here last night. They said, we've been watching that Love and Respect, which is a video series from a, a couple named Emerson and Egerich. And she said, it is making such a difference. We used to be in the crazy cycle, which is one of their other videos. And now we're in the empowering cycle, the energizing cycle. 
So these are quick little videos that you can watch. So give up one of your soap operas and start watching something that actually might make a difference. And it's a great way to have even dialogue as a family. You can watch a short video and then talk about it. And then after you've learned, then you have to make a commitment to listen. Because frankly, information is not usually what we lack. It's usually motivation. And I tell people after we do marriage team, I just gave you some great tools. You can either get in there and start fixing the problem or you can pick them up and whack each other over the head. And people do that. It's like, why aren't you doing that thing we learned in marriage team? You never do that. It's like, whack, 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 right? So we have to learn and commit ourselves to be willing to listen. And not, we're not very good at listening to start with. I don't know about you, but I'm a debater. So as soon as somebody's halfway through their sentence, I'm formulating my response. Usually how I can improve on their idea or debate it. That's not listening at all. In fact, in marriage team, we actually go through this process. You're the speaker, you're the listener. What are you trying to say and how can you say it in this way? We help craft it. And the listener, we say, now repeat it back to us. What did you hear them say? And they try to say what they thought they heard. And then they have to ask this embarrassing question. Did I get it? And you know what the answer is almost always? Partly. You got part of it, which is what we usually do. So then they have to do it again. The speaker speaks again. The listener says, here's what I thought I heard you say. Did I get it? And they keep going until the the speaker says, I think you've got it. Do you know how rarely that happens in human communication? That you actually get somebody when they're saying something, something meaningful? Let me tell you, it's a wonderful experience, but it's rare. And then you do reverse, and the other one listens. And you take turns actually really listening. And I used to always have a problem. It's like if I do that, it's like I agreed. No, you can completely listen and still not agree. Is that true? Yeah, and if you debate before you fully listen, you'll never know whether you agree or not. Because you'll already be debating. So you choose to listen. And then you choose, instead of having the dialogue of the deaf, and especially when you get emotional, to say, I want to listen to you. Because, listen carefully, the people you live with have information vital to your spiritual growth. And they're not going to tell you if you're not listening. You see, they have to live with you. I want you to ask yourself a nasty question. What am I really like to listen, to live with? What would it be like to live with me? Can you imagine living with somebody just like you? Yeah. Isn't it interesting that in a family, it's usually the two people that are most alike that have the most trouble getting along? So you commit to listening. Then you commit to choosing support. You become like the people you hang out with, just like your kids do. And if you hang around a couple, it's always griping about each other and always, when as soon as they get aside, he's like, ah, you can't believe what she said and what she did. And as soon as she gets alone, it's like, man, he is such a whatever. That'll pull your marriage down because you'll go home and have their fight for them. And I'm not saying we don't reach out and we don't support. I'm just saying you need people around you. That's part of why we try to get people into life groups. You need people that you get to know, that you trust, that pray with you, that you can share your stuff with. And instead of them saying, I don't care or trying to fix you, they say, can we pray with you? Can we support you? Can we be a part of your life here? And then you need to commit yourself to hard work. If you own a home, you have a part-time job. Is that true? Because even a new home takes fixing and settling and working, and an old home takes lots more. Marriage takes work the whole time you're married. Although I do hear that the first 50 years is the hardest. (laughs) And you commit yourself to saying, I have a lot to learn. I'm still not very good at listening. I need to come back and be willing to bring forgiveness and hope and love to my home. Wouldn't it be, guys, wouldn't it be great if that was the definition of being the head of the home? It didn't mean you got your way. It meant you're the one that brings the love. You're the one that apologizes first. You're the one that directs your family in a way that helps them. And I want to say this really strongly because our culture is messed up. 
And when couples have problems, almost across the board, you know what the advice they get from their girlfriends, from their guy friends, from their parents, is dump the creep. It doesn't matter what level of problem. You're coming to your friends and they say, oh yeah, you shouldn't have to put up with that. And the word abuse gets thrown around all over the place. And I want Family Church to be a community that says, let's come alongside and help you work on your marriage. Because marriages are important. And the more our marriages are failing, the more the next generation fails. And the more our society destabilizes. And the church is one of the few places that's saying, marriage is worth preserving. We will help you. Instead of just shaming you for if you failed, we want to come alongside and say, here's the foundation that God wants to put under your marriage. Let's help you. Let's get you some resources. Here's some counseling. Here's some marriage team. Here's some books. Let's help you. Because I know that most marriages that make it for 50 years, there was a time or two they almost didn't make it. And the difference is often the people around them who say, let's help support you. I think you can make this work. Don't give up so quickly. Be sure that you've tried everything you can before, this, before you let this go. And as a community, we need to say, what God has put together, let's let nobody separate. Does that mean that there's a time when divorce happens? Certainly. Does it mean that there's scriptural even some foundations for divorce? Yeah, we understand that. But as a call, we need to say, this is important stuff. How can we make it better? I'm going to dismiss to the Green Campus and Pastor Sky. I want you to ask this question, and I want you to think about it here. What is one thing I need to work on? It is so tempting when you're sitting in a service next to your marriage partner to think, man, I hope they got that. Boy, Paul, you really gave it to him today. And I want to move it one spot over. Why don't you say, God, what do you need me to work on? Do I need to be a better listener? I'll tell you the answer to that, yes. Do I need to be a better forgiver? Yeah. Is there somebody in your life whose marriage is struggling and you need to come alongside of them and be a support and help them? Probably. But what is it that God's speaking to you about? And will you take his words and will you put them into practice? And let's try to beat the odds, shall we? Father, thank you for your words and how relevant they are from 2,000 years ago, how, how much difference they make today. And I pray that you would help us to not just hear, but to listen and to walk out of here with a commitment to respond to you in our singleness and to build marriages carefully with good foundations. And then to work on our marriages. And then to support people whose marriages are struggling. And God, there's a lot of pain and a lot of grief and a lot of difficulty. And help us to be compassionate healers. Not judgmental about the struggles that others are having. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person, and I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really, and so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So... If you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.